If you're looking out for your next DAC upgrade and maybe you've been feeling a little bit kind of underwhelmed by the options that have been out there, then now's kind of a pretty cool time to be in the market for a DAC. And that's because we've got the brand new 4499EX chip from AKM. I reviewed that recently in the Gishelli Labs J2S DAC. But now there's also a different player on the market in the form of the D70 Pro Octo. What I've got here for us to talk about today are three devices. We've got the D70 Pro Sabre, the D70 Pro Octo, and the matching A70 Pro amplifier, or headphone amplifier, I should clarify. And what's really cool about this is there's actually some interesting innovation and some differences going on between these models. For a long time now, most DACs have been pretty much the same if they're built on a Sabre chip or an AKM chip, but that's starting to change and it's really exciting, I think. Before we dive into the content though, I do want to quickly cover off a couple of things. The first is I want to say a huge thanks to Appos Audio for making this review possible. They sent out all three of these units. And I say three, there's only two on my desk because one of them still connected up to my system. And then the other thing I wanted to quickly mention was that if you've watched a few of my videos now and you're not yet a subscriber, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button and ring the notification bell because I've got lots of great content coming. And if you're enjoying what I've got to offer, I'd love to have you join the Passion for Sound community. You can also go a step further and join me on Patreon, get access to the private Discord chat. But whatever works for you, I'd just love it if you'd hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying what I've offered lately. But let's start by talking about what you get in the form of the D70 Pro DAX. Starting off with the D70 Pro Sabre, and that comes in at $699 US dollars. As the name would suggest, it's running a Sabre chip, which means it's an ESS9039 Pro. Topping have got some marketing on the website that they're taking a new approach to the current voltage conversion. And that's because the Sabre chips output a current-based output instead of a voltage-based output. It doesn't really matter what that exactly means. I'm not going to try and explain it here. But the key thing is that when you read that marketing, they think they've done a better job of converting that current-based modulation to a voltage-based modulation. And essentially what that means in very simple terms is that instead of the current varying and the voltage staying consistent, we want the voltage varying and the current staying consistent because it's voltage fluctuations that make the sound that comes out of our headphones, speakers, or earphones. A couple of other things to talk about here are some specs, and I'm generally not a huge specs guy, but there's a reason for me talking about this here. The total harmonic distortion from the D70 Pro Sabre is 0.00006%. And then topping say that it's got a minimum signal to noise ratio of 133 decibels and a minimum crosstalk of minus 140 decibels. Now, if those numbers don't mean anything to you, don't worry too much about it. I'm going to explain in just a moment what that actually means, because it's all about the differences between the Sabre version and the Octo version. If we move over to the Octo version now, and I'll put all those specs into context in a moment, the Octo version actually comes in cheaper. It's a 599 US dollar DAC. In many ways, it's the same. I'm holding this unit here because they both look exactly the same, both in terms of the front and the back panel. The menu's a little bit different, as we'll talk about shortly. But in the case of the Octo version, instead of the Sabre chip, what we're now getting is eight Sirius Logic chips, all the same. So it's eight times the 43198 chip. And that essentially is going to mean that they're running four of them for the left channel and four of them for the right channel. If you do happen to go and look at the marketing on the Topping website or any of the retailer websites, what you'll find is there's a bit of a difference between them in terms of the marketing. And that's because there's no talk of the new current to voltage conversion for the Octo. And that's simply because these chips are going to be outputting a voltage modulated output instead of a current modulated output. But it doesn't necessarily mean that one is better or worse. They're just operating differently. If we then move forward and look at some of the specs... The total harmonic distortion from the Octo is 0.00007%, and that means that it's 0.00001% worse in theory than the Sabre. The reality is, though, when we get to total harmonic distortion levels that are that low, it kind of becomes a bit irrelevant. 
because your speakers, your amplifiers, your headphones, any of those things are probably going to have significantly higher distortion levels than what these are providing. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider distortion. It's totally okay to look at those specs. I just don't think you should overly weight them in your decision making process. If we then look at the signal to noise ratio, things get a little bit tricky here. And that's because in the marketing, topping haven't stayed consistent. In the case of the Sabre DAC, they've said it is a minimum signal to noise ratio. In the case of the Octo DAC, they're giving you different signal to noise ratio figures for the balanced and the single ended outputs. And so my guess is that on the D70 Pro Sabre, what they're actually quoting is the RCA output, whereas the maximum you can get from the Octo looks higher because you can actually look at it for the XLRs and for the RCAs. And so the maximum signal to noise ratio from the Octo DAC is actually 1 dB better than it is from the Sabre DAC. But whether or not that actually means anything, that's a whole other question. Whether or not the Sabre DAC has been measured and that minimum figure is based on the RCAs is unclear. So it's actually really hard to compare these two. And what I would actually say is they're pretty comparable in terms of signal to noise ratio. When we then look at the crosstalk figures, the Octo has a crosstalk figure of minus 149 dB. And that means it's about minus 9 dB better than the Sabre. But once again, we don't know the specifics of what that means from the Sabre version because it's unclear whether that's from the RCA outputs, maybe it depends on the input you're using, all of that's unclear. And so it's very hard to compare them. What I would say though is that both have excellent signal to noise ratio and excellent crosstalk figures. The Octo appears to be a little bit better, but we don't know for sure. And so in most ways, the Octo and the Sabre are very comparable. I was really unclear when I looked at both of these models as to which was actually meant to be better. Obviously the price tag would suggest that the Sabre's meant to be better, but the specifications tell a slightly different story. They would suggest they're kind of on par, and in some ways they might suggest that the Octo's better. One area that you can start to differentiate these DACs is when you go through the menu systems. And specifically what you'll find is there's a couple of options on the Sabre that are not available on the Octo. And those options do make it look maybe like it's a more premium function, but that just could also be what's available from the chip itself. And specifically what I mean is that on the Sabre version, you've got things like the sound modes. So you can go through a valve mode, a transistor mode, or have it switched off altogether. And what that's basically going to be doing is adding different sorts of distortion deliberately into the sound, just to color it a little bit. And I haven't gone into depth on those. I don't tend to use those sound modes. I like to add coloration down the chain if I'm adding it at all. But that's a feature that's in the Sabre version that's not in the Octo version. And then the other two things you'll find that are different is that the Sabre has some jitter settings available. So you can change the bandwidth of what I'm assuming is a phase lock loop system. Don't worry about what that means. The gist of it is that you can increase or decrease the bandwidth number to change the way the DAC is trying to lock down jitter. Again, I haven't played with this one. It's not something I tend to find that's necessary. I've left it on the default setting of five, but I think from memory it goes all the way up to 15 and down to level four. The final thing that's different between these two then is the filters. And that's very much something that's different from every manufacturer. Whether it's Cirrus Logic, AKM or Sabre, they all have different filters available. And so it's not unusual to find the filters called different things or a different number of filters and range of options. And that's definitely the case between the Octo and the Sabre. As to which is better, that's very hard to say. The one thing that I can clearly say is that you get more choices from the Octo DAC than you do from the Sabre DAC. And you do get an option that's called NOS mode, so non-oversampling which theoretically means that you're not using any filters from the DAC chip itself and can feed it external filters from software like HQ Player. I don't have the test gear to actually measure it and know if it's true non-oversampling, but the option's there and you've got more overall options to play with in the case of the Octo. So on paper, these are pretty similar, slightly different specifications, slightly different menu options, but the core functionality remains exactly the same between the two of them. And therefore, for me at least, it's all going to come down to how they sound. Before we get to that though, let's quickly introduce the A70 Pro headphone amplifier and preamplifier, and then we'll do device tours of all three units. And so if we have a look now at the A70 Pro down the bottom here, this is it here, and as you'll see, it's very much in the same style as the D70 DAC. Obviously now we've got some headphone outputs on the front, and the A70 Pro here comes in at $499, US and it's got probably three major claims to fame that I can see. I'm not going to go through and list all the different specifications, because I don't actually believe specifications tell you much of a story about an amplifier, unless they're way off the charts in some sort of bad way generally. But in our modern market of headphone amps, there's not a huge amount you really need to worry about with specifications. And so the key things that stand out here is that this thing is ridiculously powerful. 
the A70 Pro will output 12.6 watts into a 32 ohm load, which is just completely and utterly insane. It is so far beyond what any headphone on the planet needs that I don't quite understand the reason for it, but it's also not a problem because what they've also got in here is a wonderful relay stepped volume control. And what that means is that as you're turning the volume control here, it's not actually a normal potentiometer type control, it's sending some kind of digital or electrical signal into the amplifier to tell it to move through a whole series of resistors and they're going to control the volume. What that means is you've got extremely precise volume control all the way down to the bottom, no channel imbalance, and complete and utter control over that 12.6 watts of power into a 32 ohm load. And so ultimately that does kind of make the power a little bit irrelevant. As I said, it's got way more than you need. It's not a reason to buy this because it's got so much power, but the good news is having all that power hasn't led to an amplifier that's uncontrollable. Both the gain levels are okay, which is how loud the amplifier gets at each step of the volume, but then what's also great is it hasn't resulted in a high noise floor, and so you can use that volume all the way down to the bottom and it will stay completely silent, except for the music of course. The final claim to fame that this amp has, and I think it's fantastic, is it's also got a switch on the back, and we might look at that in just a second, but the switch on the back is designed as a ground lift, and that means it's going to break any ground loops that you might have. Let's say you've got a set of active monitors, they're often a really bad source for ground loops. If you do have a problem with a hum coming through them, there's a switch on the back here you can quickly flick and see if that solves it. It may or may not do the trick, but it's really nice to have the ability to quickly and easily check. And so with all that said, let's do a quick tour of the A70 Pro and then we'll look at the D70s while I've got them in my hands. Starting off with the A70 Pro here in my hands, it's a very simple design. I think it's a stylish design. I like it better than the old topping designs. Starting off over here on your right hand side, we've got the control knob. That's both a rotational knob for things like volume, moving through the menu, as well as the selector button that you can hear there. Then as we move along, we've got single ended output, 6.3mm, a balanced 4.4mm and a balanced 4-pin XLR socket. And so this is, as I understand it, a fully balanced amplifier operating on the inside, for those that care about that. And then the only other thing to talk about on the front panel is the lovely full colour display. This is a really nice step forward for me in the topping designs. Both I like how it's positioned and sculpted at the front, I like the little kind of angled bevel as it steps out to the screen, but on top of that it gives great functionality. If you're a fan of VU meters or fast Fourier transforms, that's kind of like the vertical line looking thing that shows you all the different frequencies in the music, then you can have it set to that, or you can just have it set to a simple display of what's being used in terms of your inputs, your outputs, the volume level, etc. It's completely customizable, completely up to you. There's all the other controls you'd expect in there as well, things like the dimmer, how bright the screen is in other words, what the gain level is, whether you've got all outputs on or just some of the outputs on, all that selectable through the display, it just makes it a very easy intuitive system to interact with. So I'm a big fan of the new interface on the A70 Pro, I think it's excellent. As we look around at the back, things are very very simple as you'd expect for a headphone amplifier and preamp, with the exception of this ground lift switch that I spoke about before. So just quickly starting over on the very side, we've got our mains power switch. So you can put this in standby of course from the front, but your mains power switch is on the back. It's a regular full-sized IEC power socket, which means there's going to be a switch mode power supply inside the amp here. We've got a firmware update socket, that's a USB-C socket. The ground lift switch, which as I said before, what that's going to do is when you switch that, it's going to disconnect the earth pin from your mains power cable. And in my experience, it can be really helpful if you're running other devices that use DC connectors. So I mean those sort of barrel style connectors that normally come from a Walwart style power supply. What those connectors give you is generally a connection to the active and the neutral within your home power, but not actually to the earth. And that's where you can sometimes get ground loops because this is the only connection to the actual earth or ground circuit in the house. And that's where you sometimes get the feedback through these systems and that's where disconnecting the earth here can help to prevent the noise. Moving on now before this turns into a ground loop episode, and what we've got next to the power section is a 12 volt input and output, and that means you can trigger things like a power amplifier, or this can be triggered on and off by the DAC. It's essentially an on off system using a very simple 12 volt signal to trigger things when the first piece of the source chain has been switched on or switched off. As you'd expect, there's one of these on the D70 Pro DACs as well, and so the idea is you can switch on the DAC, it's going to send 12 volts out and into the A70 Pro, which can then send 12 volts out and into, say, a power amp if you're using this as a preamp. So it's a really nice convenience feature. The one thing I'd flag is that I don't think, and I think I've checked the boxes properly, I don't think I've received any of the 3.5mm connection cables that would normally carry that 12 volt signal from, say, a D70 into the A70. So it would have been nice to see that. Maybe the units sent to me were B stock. Maybe they'd been opened before and repacked. I don't know. 
but I didn't have the cables in mind and it would be nice to see them included. If you bought yourself a D70 and or an A70, then do let us know in the comments, did you receive the 3.5mm cables for the 12 volt triggers? If you did, that's great. It'd be really helpful to know. As we move on from the triggers though, we've got everything else pretty standard until we get to this end. And what that means is we've got XLR inputs and outputs and RCA inputs and outputs. Because keep in mind, this will both receive your signal from your DAC for amplification duties, but also can operate as a preamp and therefore give you volume control to send out to active monitors or a separate power amp. The final thing to talk about here is we've also got this DIN connection, and this is because the A70 Pro can also feed out to Topping's dedicated preamplifier range. And so this is basically an extender solution. You can plug in something like the Pre90 as I understand it, and that's going to give you further preamplification functionality. And so that's the A70 Pro in a tour. Let's now take a look at the D70 Pro and you'll see a lot of it is very, very similar. Starting on the front panel, we've got the same exact type of design. You've got your volume control knob over here. This can work as a preamp or you could have it work as a pure DAC with no volume control. We've obviously got no outputs on the front. This is just a DAC. And then we've got the same type of screen and interface that we had on the A70 Pro. So again, you've got the VU meter, you've got the fast Fourier transform display. And then you've got access to all the different settings like which filters are working, which inputs you're using, which outputs you're using. All of that is also also contained within the menu. And so let's jump around to the back. And as I said before, this is all identical. Whether you get the Octo or the Sabre version, both D70 Pro devices are identical in terms of the outside look and feel and generally speaking, how they work. There are those few little subtle changes in the menu options between the Sabre and the Octo. But other than that, we're talking exactly the same units. And so again, we've got our mains power and our mains power switch. We've got our 12 volt trigger to feed out the downstream devices. You might also feed into this one and it has that capability. If say your streamer is at the very top of your chain and it has a 12 volt output, that could trigger this, this could trigger that, and so on and so forth. From there, we've got our digital inputs. So we've got AES, USB-B, we've got a Bluetooth antenna there, and this has high def codecs on both the Octo and the Sabre. We've then got an optical input and a coaxial spitter input. And then finally, next to those, we've got outputs for XLR and RCA. And as I said before, these can be both variable outputs or fixed level outputs. While we're talking about those outputs, something else that I kind of like about the D70 Pros is that you do have some control over the output voltage. Now, I haven't got it in my notes, but from memory, you can choose to have the XLRs output the standard 4 volt, or you can pump that up to 5 volts. And then on the RCAs, from memory, you've got 2 volt or 3 volt options. So if you do find your system needs a bit of extra gain, a bit of extra volume to it, having a higher output level from these outputs can help. But do be aware, some systems, some amplifiers, for instance, or headphone amplifiers, won't like a high level input and you could end up clipping the input stage. So my recommendation would be generally stick with the 4 volt and the 2 volt respectively for XLR and RCA. But you can always play around with the higher output levels if you think you need them. But just be aware of any degradation in sound that might be a sign of clipping the input stage on your amp. And so that's a quick tour of all three devices, even though I've only shown you two because the two D70s look exactly the same. But that's what you get and what to expect when you buy yourself a D70 and or A70 Pro. And so the big question now, of course, is how do they all sound? And so I've got a bunch of different information to share with you now. But before we dive into that, I just want to remind you that I've recently updated the Passion for Sounds recommends databases. It used to be a single database that you had to filter. But what you'll find now is if you look down below in the description section, I've now got a category database for each different type of product. So there's a database of the headphones I recommend, the DACs I recommend, the headphone amps I recommend, etc. What that means is you can click on the link down there and very quickly see a list of all the products that I think are great at the price points and also have access then to links to the reviews and also purchasing links too. So hopefully it makes it very easy for you to find the products that I think are worth considering and then also easily access the reviews and the retailer sites to check them out for yourself. So if you're in the market for any type of product, check out the Passion for Sounds recommends databases below. I hope they're really helpful. And with that said, let's start talking about the sound of the D70 DAX. And I thought the best way to really test these properly was just to put them up against one another. In many ways, they're identical, but they are, of course, using a completely different DAC chip or DAC chips, as in the case of the Octo. And so I thought the best way to separate them and work out if they're good, if one is better than the other, if they're just different, was to put them right up against one another. So I plugged both of them into the Burson Solovus 3X GT. I listened to them using the Foco Utopia 2022 model. That was my setup for my listening notes at least, but I've also used both DACs in my near field speaker listening system. I've also used it with other headphone amps and other headphones. 
but for my listening notes it was the Solaris GT that allows me to quickly switch between two balanced inputs and then also the Focal Utopia 2022. I made sure that both DACs were running exactly the same filter. It is called something a little bit different on the two of them, but in both cases it was the fast roll-off with linear phase. From there, I made notes on the track Lonesome Road by Madeline Peru. But in case you're new to the channel, I always use lots of different tracks before I make up my mind about anything. I just share specific tracks so you can go and listen to them for yourselves, maybe discover some new music. It's not the only track I used for my testing. To further help remove any bias from this, given the differences in price, etc., I connected these up without actually looking at which one was connected where. I was using Super XLRs for both, so I had no way of telling from the cables which was which. I just plugged in a pair of red and black into one, a pair of red and black into the other, and without knowing which was which, I switched between input one, input two, and made my notes. Listening to Lonesome Road and starting off on input one, and the sound was nice. I would have liked a little tiny bit more depth in the sound stage, but it was sounding generally pretty good as a baseline. And that's probably a good summary for both of these DACs is that they're a really good solid DAC. As to which one I think might be better or worse, we'll get to that shortly. But if you were to buy either of them, you're getting yourself a good solid Delta Sigma DAC. Switching over to input two, and the sound immediately got a little bit crisper. There's a sense of a tiny bit of, I wouldn't say brightness, but a little bit more edge in the sound, just a very, very tiny dash more. Or you could say it's got a little bit less warmth compared to input one. Flipping back again, I felt like input one did have a bit more weight through the mid range in particular. So the mids and down into the bass a little bit. And then switching back over to input two, in this track, there's some use of brushes on snares in the drum kit. And hearing it from input two, there's definitely more sense that you're hearing more of the brushes on the skins of the drums. And that's not necessarily a good thing. It wasn't that it was lacking from input one, it was that on input two, it was almost enhanced a little bit and probably over enhanced a little bit to my tastes. And so based on this first track, I was feeling like input one was the more natural sounding DAC. Input two was pushing a bit more detail forward, a little bit crisper, a little tiny bit edgier, and not necessarily in a good way, unless you're a huge fan of detail or unless you've got a warmer, richer sounding system that you're pairing it with. But I also wasn't convinced that this track that I'd started with Lonesome Road was showing me the whole picture. So I moved over to another track to continue my note taking, and this time it was Save Me by Dave Matthews. Flipping back and forth between input one and input two, and it was very clear on this track that there's more weight, more body from the input one DAC. The bass seems to reach deeper on input one, and it's got a bit more impact to it as well. I felt like I was feeling the bass much more, and I say much more in the sense that it's not a huge shift, but it was a much clearer sense of bass impact from input one DAC than it was to input two DAC. I also felt like input one, and this could be partly due to the extra weight in the sound, input one brought the vocals a little bit closer to me. It didn't become congested, but it felt like the vocalist maybe took like a step forwards towards me in my listening position. But at the same time, the stage seemed to stretch a little bit wider as well. And overall, as I flipped back and forth between the two of them, I found myself consistently preferring the tonality of the input one DAC. I also though found myself preferring the presentation. The input 2 DAC was not quite as wide, and it was kind of very flat overall, quite two-dimensional. There was a little bit more distance between me and the main vocalist or the main instrumentalist, but other than that bit of distance, everything else was kind of on the same plane. Whereas I felt like moving over to the input 1 DAC, I was getting a sense of a little tiny bit more width in the soundstage. Also, though, I was getting a bit more sense of layering and depth, even though the most kind of the closest sounds were a bit closer than from input 2, if that makes sense. And so for me, that was the presentation I preferred from the Input 1 DAC. And in case you're wondering, I know I certainly was, the Input 1 DAC is the D70 Pro Octo. So the D70 Pro Sabre delivered kind of what I expect from Delta Sigma. Lots of detail, a kind of emphasis on detail, but a very flat presentation. What the Octo DAC somehow does though, is it starts to give you a sound that's a little bit more like say a multi-bit DAC or an R2R DAC. It is still very much, in my opinion, sounding like a Delta Sigma DAC in most ways, but it's got just a little bit more sense of depth and layering, and it's got a lovely sense of kind of natural body to the sound. It's not a thick, rich, or warm DAC, but it is definitely a more solid sounding DAC than something like the D70 Pro Sabre. And so having confirmed that for me at least, the D70 Pro Octo is the better choice out of these two, which is a bonus because it's also the cheaper one, having confirmed that the Octo is to me at least the better sounding DAC, I was then curious to know how well the D70 Octo goes up against other quality DACs. And so there were three DACs in total that I wanted to try, and the first one that I reached for was another Delta Sigma DAC in the form of the Eversolo DAC Z8. 
This retails for $699 US dollars, making it exactly the same price as the D70 Pro Sabre, but pairing up the Eversolo DAC Z8 for $699 US dollars and comparing it to the D70 Pro Octo for $599 US dollars. I was curious to see if having a different and maybe better implementation of a very similar design of the D70 Pro Sabre, I was curious to see if it was more about the implementation and the tuning of the system rather than which chip was used. Listening to Spoons by Rudimental, and the very first thing I noticed was that the difference between the DAC Z8 and the D70 Pro Octo was far closer than the D70 Pro Sabre and the D70 Pro Octo. The Octo is still a slightly kind of meatier sounding DAC. It's got that weight and that presence down low that for me is still a step ahead of something like the Eversolo DAC Z8. But having said that, the DAC Z8 is kind of a little bit smoother overall. It's like it's a bit more refined in its delivery of the sound. And that might sound strange because I've just finished saying that the Octo has that sort of sense of weight and body and presence in the lower registers. But what I'm really talking about here is when you get to the top end, the DAC Z8 has a nice refined and controlled sense of treble. It's not a smooth, rich or warm sounding DAC by any stretch, but it is a bit more refined than its treble delivery when compared to the D70 Pro Octo. Ultimately though, as I flicked back and forth between them, I think I would be completely happy with either of these. Neither of these DACs is giving me a huge amount of space and depth in the soundstage, although both are quite good for Delta Sigma DAC. I do like the DAC Z8 sense of smoothness and refinement, but then on the flip side, I like the sense of presence and impact that the D70 Pro Octo gives me in the bass. And so it's actually been a really tough call as to which DAC I wanted to put back into my system. And for now, it's the D70 Pro Octo, but I can quite easily see myself flipping between the two on a regular basis. Both have a lovely interface, great controls, and a very, very good sound. What that means though, is that if you just want to save yourself $100 and only spend $599 US dollars, then the D70 Pro Octo is giving you DAC Z8 performance, albeit a little bit different, but it's giving you DAC Z8 level performance for $100 less, and that's fantastic. And so at this point, I was very, very impressed with the D70 Pro Octo, but that got me thinking, is it really as good as I think it is? Can it maybe start to stretch outside of the realm of Delta Sigma DAX and start competing with options like the still Delta Sigma, but the new 4499EX from AKM and or the Shit Bifrost 264, which is a multi-bit DAC from Shit. I'm not going to go through full listing notes here because of the time it's going to take and we haven't gotten to the A70 Pro amplifier yet. But just to summarize my comparison between the D70 Pro Octo and the Giselli Labs J2S AK4499EX version, and by the way, the J2S that I've got here is running the Spyco's Labs op amps, it's got the USB card installed, it's a much more expensive DAC than the Octo, but with that particular setup that I've got there that's probably in the 750 odd US dollar range, I think, what we're talking about there is a DAC that does clearly perform better than the Octo. It delivers a bit more nuance in the sound, just fine sort of micro detail information, and also gives you more layering in the sound stage. You do start to hear more depth, more separation of sounds from a front to back point of view, whilst also having that excellent left-right separation that the D70 Octo is already very good at. And so the good news for the D70 Pro Octo is that the differences are minimal, they're very, very close, but the bad news for the D70 Octo and the good news for Giselli is that the J2S with the AK4499EX is a clear step up in sound. It's not a big leap. Whether it's a couple of hundred dollars worth, that's a whole other question. But the J2S AK4499EX DAC is the one I would choose if I didn't need the interface, didn't need volume control, and didn't need Bluetooth. And so then the final test with the D70 Pro Octo before I moved over to the amplifier was to put it up against the shit Bifrost 264. And the reason for that for me was that the Shit Bifrost 264 still is slightly better for me than something like the J2S. And the reason for that is that I slightly prefer the way that Shit's proprietary multi-bit technology delivers a sense of depth and layering in the soundstage. It doesn't get quite to the same scale as things like chord DACs or some R2R DACs, but as a bridge between the traditional Delta Sigma approach and the sort of chord or the R2R approach, I find the Shit is a really good balance point and the Bifrost 264 being an excellent example of that. Once again, you're spending more money on a Bifrost 264 than you are on a D70 Pro Octo. And once again, the Bifrost 264 is a pure DAC. There's no volume control, there's no Bluetooth, there's basically no controls other than switching it on, switching it off, and selecting an input. And so the Bifrost 264 is once again much more like the J2S in that sense than it is like the Octo. As I compared the two, what I found was that the D70 Pro Octo's sound was actually closer in its general kind of sound, performance, etc. 
to the Bifrost 264 than it was to the Gicelli Labs. There was a clear difference in things like tonality, detail retrieval, etc. between the Octo and the J2S than there was between the Bifrost 2 and the Octo. Now what that means for us is that tonally, I think the Bifrost 264 and the Octo are very, very similar. The Bifrost 264 is still better in terms of layering and depth, but I didn't get the same sense of kind of detail retrieval and that nuance of the micro details that I felt like the J2S was just extracting a little bit more when compared to the Bifrost 2 and to the Octo. Now just to be clear, I kind of put the Bifrost 264 and the J2S at about the same level of performance with just different presentations. And so specifically, I think the Bifrost 264 is doing a better job at delivering the depth and the layering in the soundstage. I think soundstage size is probably fairly similar. The Bifrost 264 may come across a little bit narrower because it stretches a little bit deeper, but that's kind of the biggest difference. And that's because the tonality of the two is very, very similar. The J2S is a little bit brighter in its sound, and that's where it does tend to bring forward some of the details, those micro kind of textual information that separated it from the Octo for me. Whereas the Bifrost 264 is a slightly weightier, warmer sound. And I actually prefer that over the J2S ever so slightly. Where things got really interesting for me though, was that the Octo is actually meatier still. And again, it's not a thick, rich, warm sounding DAC. It's just got this big booty bass. It's controlled, it's detailed, it's accurate, but it's just got weight and presence down low. And that's what I'm really liking about the D70 Pro Octo. And so for me, it really comes down to the question of, do you not want to spend more than $600, just get the Octo? Or if it's not so much about the money and it's more about functionality and sound, the D70 Pro Octo is the one you go for if you want volume control, Bluetooth, etc. And then beyond that, it's going to come down to whether you want that meaty kind of bass presentation, maybe without quite as much depth and layering, or if you want to go to a middle of the road where you're still getting that sort of meatier, slightly smoother presentation with excellent layering and depth, or you go to the other step in the J2S where you're getting a crisper, cleaner sounding DAC that's a bit more resolving in the micro details and textures because it lacks a little bit of that weight and body that for me at least, I sometimes want to touch more of. And so the great news is we've got three brilliant options on the table now. You've got the Gishelli Labs J2S, the Shit Bifrost 264, and the new favourite on the market for me, and I mean equal favourite, in the D70 Pro Octo. This is a fantastic DAC that has completely redefined my expectations of traditional Delta Sigma DACs. And I say traditional in the sense that it's still using an off-the-shelf Delta Sigma chip, not a dual chip system like the 4499EX, but just in this case, eight copies of exactly the same chip. Whatever magic topping have worked there, it's definitely succeeded. And so let's park my praise here of the D70 Pro Octo for a moment and start talking about the companion amp in the A70 Pro. As you'd expect in this day and age and coming from a brand like Topping, there's nothing to complain about with the A70 Pro. Topping make good solid amplifiers for the most part. They very rarely, if ever, make a dedicated headphone amp that doesn't sound good. Some of them have been a bit muted at times, a bit lacking in kind of engagement and dynamics, but they really go wrong. And in the case of the A70 Pro, listening to it in isolation, I'd say that not only have they not gone wrong, but that this is a really lovely amp. Much like the Delta Sigma DAC chips, it doesn't tend to produce a particularly large sense of soundstage depth. But beyond that, it does everything well. Tonality is solid, very neutral, very clean, but not sterile. Separation and imaging is good within a fairly two-dimensional space. There's absolutely nothing to complain about with the A70 Pro when considering it in isolation. And so rather than talking about it extensively in isolation, I want to jump straight to a comparison. For $499 US dollars, you can buy yourself an A70 Pro, or for around about the same money, you can buy yourself a Gishelli Labs A3 Pro. Now it's pure coincidence that I'm comparing both the DAC and the AMP to Gishelli products. It just so happens that Gishelli have produced two game changers lately. And so on this occasion, it was more about the value and the known performance of these two AMPs rather than a particular favoritism for a particular brand. For this testing, I was using the D70 Pro Octo as my DAC, and the main reason for that was that I wanted to keep in mind the fact that a really nice looking stack like a D70 Pro Octo with an A70 Pro amplifier, that could be preferable. And so I wanted to pair these up because there's definitely value for me at least in having a nice looking system, rather than a mismatch of one looking DAC and one looking amp. And so I used the D70 Pro Octo as the DAC for both of them. And then the track that I made my notes on was Warm Shadow by Fink as I listened to it through the A70 Pro and through the Gishelli Labs A3 Pro. Starting off on the A70 and it sounds wonderful. There's absolutely nothing you would want more of based on the isolated listening experience of this stack. 
I say this stack, this is actually the Sabre deck here, but imagine it was the Octo. The Octo plus the A70 Pro is all most people are going to want. The kick bass in this track had a wonderful sense of punch from this combination. The guitar work is articulate and crisp. And overall, there's a good sense of weight to everything without losing clarity. And this goes back to what I said before. The A70 Pro is a really nicely balanced sounding amp. It doesn't stray into warmth or thickness, nor does it stray into sterility and clinicalness. It's just a really nice sounding detailed but natural sounding amp. One thing that did stand out to me though is that the way this track's recorded, it's a live recording, and the way it's been recording is a little bit odd. There's quite a lot of reverb applied to the vocal, and from memory it's off in the left hand channel as well, rather than a sort of dead center that we're used to from vocals. And what I was finding was that the A70 Pro had quite a two dimensional presentation, and, and what I mean by two dimensional is again, it's kind of that wall of sound rather than layers. And as such, the reverb kind of didn't make sense. As I was hearing it, there was this kind of artificial sense of space created by the reverb, but I couldn't hear that any of the instruments or sounds had any sense of depth or layering to them, and it was a little bit off-putting. I was conscious, though, that that could have been the recording, and so I switched over to the A3 Pro to see how it handled it. And it was very immediately obvious that the A3 Pro was producing space and layering in a way that the A70 Pro couldn't. The sound from the A3 Pro was just as detailed, but at the same time somehow smoother. It was a more lifelike presentation, whereas the A70 Pro was just kind of overdoing some of the leading edges of notes, whatever it was, it was just enhancing the texture and the clarity in a way that wasn't completely natural and didn't result in more sense of detail, just a slightly less natural sound. The A3 Pro maintained the same level of bass weight. That was something I was aware of with the A70 Pro was it's got a really nice sense of bass control, bass delivery, and the A3 Pro didn't lose any of that. Coming back now to that vocal that I mentioned with the reverb, and whilst it was still in my left ear, it somehow sounded more natural because the amp was able to produce a sense of depth within the overall soundstage. And so that reverb creating the sense that you're in a cavern now matched up with what the sense of space was that the A3 Pro was delivering. So no longer did that reverb sound so artificial, it now sounded more like it belonged in the space that I was listening to. I can't stress enough here, this was just pure luck that I stumbled on this particular track and it had this particular issue. It's not to say the A70 Pro is going to cause weird, unnatural sounds in every single thing you listen to. For 99% of tracks, it's going to sound wonderful. But the key difference that you can call out from this comparison is that the A3 Pro just produces space, separation, and most importantly, layering and depth that the A70 Pro can't. And the result of that is that when you listen to a recording that has a good sense of space or has different sonic cues spread around space, the A3 Pro is going to do a better job of recreating them. I also think the A3 Pro has a slight edge on tonality because of its way of delivering lots of detail, but very smoothly. And so for those two reasons, I think the A3 Pro is definitely the better amplifier, but the A70 Pro is no slouch. Now it is worth mentioning that the A3 Pro is vastly less powerful than the A70 Pro. I think it has only one watt at 32 ohms. And I say only because realistically, the A3 Pro has got more than enough power for every single headphone I can think of, except maybe, and this is even a maybe, the Susvara, the HE6SE from Hyferman, the Abyss 1266, and maybe the Abyss Diana. And the reason I say maybe is that if you're listening to those headphones at normal listening levels, the A3 Pro is actually still going to drive them fine. But if you're a loud listener, or if you're using a lot of EQ, that's where you probably will want more power for those headphones, not for all headphones, but for those headphones, you'll probably want more power than what the A3 Pro gives you. And that's where something like the A70 Pro might be a better choice. But having said that, you are going to be trading off the fact that you're now getting a slightly less natural tonality and also a slightly flatter soundstage. And this might sound like a knock on the A70 Pro. I really hope it doesn't. I think the A70 Pro, for a chip-based, nested feedback style design that Topping generally do, I haven't double-checked how they've done it in the A70 Pro, but I'm assuming they're using chip-based op-amps, and they're also going to be using some sort of nested feedback to get really good measurements. The result of that is always a nice, clean sound. In this case, I think tonally, it's as good as it gets for that type of approach, but it also results in a flatter sound stage and a less natural overall sound. And so as I said before, if the price and or the look of this combo is important to you, you can absolutely buy yourself the A70 Pro and the D70 Pro Octo and have yourself an incredibly good sounding sound system. But at the same time, you could also go out there and get a better quality amp and or DAC depending on your needs.
And so to bring all this to a close, the things I'm going to say is that I think the D70 Pro Octo is absolutely brilliant for what it offers. It doesn't quite match the 4499 EX from Gishelli or the Shit Bifrost 264, but it comes so close for a significantly smaller amount of money that I think it's absolutely one to recommend. I think the D70 Pro Sabre kind of becomes a little bit irrelevant because the D70 Pro Octo exists. As I said at the beginning, unless you've got a rich warm system and you want the extra sense of kind of edginess, clarity, it's not an edgy harsh sounding DAC, but it's got less of that sort of weight and smoothness that the D70 Pro Octo has and it's good for. If you needed that sense of clarity and attack, the D70 Pro Sabre might be a better choice, but I think that's going to be a very small percentage of people that it's actually going to be better for. And then moving to the A70 Pro Amp, I think it's a lovely, excellent amp, particularly if you want a really nice, kind of clean looking stack. But as is often the case, a discrete design headphone amp and preamp, such as the A3 Pro, the Shit Jotunheim 2 is probably another option to think about as well, the Singer SA1. There's a few others around the similar price point that I think are a better choice. And so hopefully I've been able to give you some clarity on these three options. As I said at the beginning, we're really spoiled for choice at the moment. We've got some incredible innovative and quality audio gear that's coming out at the moment for us to choose from. And there's really no wrong choice in any of the products that I've talked today. There's just good choices and even better choices. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's provided clarity for you. And if you have found the video useful, helpful, and enjoyable, I'd love it if you hit the like button and please subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. For now though, let me leave it to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.